Hey gum people, I'm going to talk about, uh, I got a couple questions on what do you, what would my advice be after you were in a shooting on, on how to deal with the cops in the aftermath? And this is a pretty broad complex question because there's a lot of factors that go into play here, but I'm going to try to cover basically some of the things that you ought to be considering. Um, first of all, the government's not your friend. I don't care how good or how wherever you're at, how good the DA, whether you vote, whatever. If, if the facts come out that you did something wrong, they're going to charge you no matter who you are. And if the facts come out that you didn't do anything wrong, they're going to look to see if there's any reason they could charge you. So a shooting is a, is a critical encounter. It's usually a life-threatening event. Um, you need to make sure and express. The biggest thing that get people in trouble after shooting is their mouth, their statement, what they say. Even for cops, after a shooting, you know, uh, you shoot a guy, first cop comes up, his mic's on, you don't know your mic's on, you go, that son of a bitch pulled a gun on me, I put a, I put a bullet in his ass, he's dead now. Man, you, you've just made your life very, very difficult. <coughs> so, understanding that the, the first thing you want to do is, is think before, plan, and realize after you're in a shooting, you're going to be amped up. You're going to be in fight or flight. Your blood pressure is going to be up. Your heart rate's going to be up. You're going to have auditory exclusion. You're not going to be thinking right. Your primitive brain, that fight or flight, really understanding fight or flight will help prepare you. It gets you in that brain, long-term memory, what you're saying. You're not thinking about long-term survival in a fight or flight. You're thinking at an immediate. So controlling that. Uh, you know, cops, when we're, when we're taught, when we get in high-risk situations, shootings, etc., you have to calm yourself. Concentrate on your breathing. Be able to take in and count to four. One, two, three, four. Breathe in. Exhale. One, two, three, four. Doing that for a minute will slow your heart rate down. It'll slow down that fight or flight process. It will get you to thinking. Unfortunately, a minute after shooting is a very long time because you're going in fast motion. Things are going in slow motion. Your whole life just went before your eyes. You think you're going to die. Now there's a guy dead either in your house, on your floor, or wherever you killed him. And now the cops are coming and everybody's pointing guns at you, telling you to drop your gun. And you're like, hey, hey, I'm the good guy. I was defending my. Shut up. Put your hand up. Get on the ground. You're handcuffed. You think you're going to jail. You're scared. The cops come in. They start questioning you. And you're like, ah, maybe if I just tell the truth and be honest I'll be okay bad advice okay you want to keep your mouth shut nothing good I've got another video why you should never talk to the cops and if you go on my page I'll put a link on a page I click to this video where this attorney explains why you should never talk to the cops great education okay anybody that ever has an attorney what's the first thing the cops tell them invoke your right to remain silent don't give a statement be quiet that's what they tell you now Unfortunately, if you get in a shooting, you kill somebody, and you don't say anything, and you just invoke your right to remain silent, the cops are going to come to the conclusion. They're going to call the DA. They're going to call a supervisor and say, hey, man, guy's dead. Guy's got a gun, but he won't tell us what happened, so, you know, we, we, we got no choice. We got to arrest him for homicide since he won't talk because we don't know until we find out. So then you end up going to jail for not saying a statement. You may end up going to jail anyway. So you're going to, there's a fine line between cooperating and giving a minimal statement and requesting counsel versus just, hey, I'm here to help, whatever you need, I'm going to be honest with the cops, I'm going to tell you everything you want to know, just ask me questions, I'm a good citizen, I got nothing to hide. Man, that's a bad approach. Our system is not based on rewarding honesty. Our system is based on <laughs> dishonesty, what we can prove, how you can prove it. That's our whole system. It's all adversarial. There's no benefit whatsoever. You get no reduced sentence for being honest. You get no less time. You get no less charges. If two guys commit the same crime and one guy goes, man, I'm sorry, I did it, I confess, I did everything, the other guy goes, screw you, I ain't giving a statement, they both get the same time. Absolutely no benefit to being cooperative with the police. Okay? Now, with that said, you can help yourself by giving a proper statement. 
a statement that puts in your frame of mind, minimal, your fear of your life or your fear of your safety or the safety of others. Okay? I thought I was going to die. I can't believe I had this guy made me shoot him because if I didn't, I would be dead. I was in fear of my life. I was scared to death. I thought I was going to be die. I thought I was dead. I can't believe I had to shoot this guy. I thought I was dead. The more you can get out that you thought you were going to die and that you were fearful of dying and that you were fearful of your life or the life of others, that moves you further into justified homicide. Because pretty much, I mean, Texas is a little different. You can protect your property, but there's still some kind of iffy things on property. I can't shoot a guy in the daytime if he comes out here, gets on my bike, and rides off. Technically, the letter of the law says if I don't think I'm getting my property back, I can shoot him. But I don't think that's going to be ruled a good sh shooting if a guy takes your bicycle and rides off. Okay? Now, if he takes your, your $4,000 extra special air weight bike system that you can't replace, maybe you're a little bit more justified. Uh, but at night, if he comes in, he's in your garage and he's trying to steal your bike, you can shoot him, no questions asked, period. He, you know, he's still in your property, he's on your property at night, fear is presumed, you're protecting your property and your life, hey, you're good to go. But even then, there's going to be questions. If you come out and you shoot somebody illegal, a guy kicks in your door, and comes in your house with a gun and says, I'm going to kill everybody in this house, and you shoot him, that's a perfect justified shooting. But if the cops come and you go, yeah, I'm glad he picked my house. I got these new special rounds, and I got this new gun that I've been wanting to try out. Man, I'm so happy he picked my house because I got to try it out. And Man, I got it. He, he paid the price. I showed him. That's not a good statement. That's very easy for a prosecution to say, you really weren't fair of your life. Maybe you could have done something else besides shooting. Maybe shooting him wasn't your only choice if you weren't that scared. If you had all this power and you knew you killed him, maybe you could have challenged him and asked him to drop a gun or you're going to shoot him before you shot him. So you get into all these if am butts and coconuts, and that's where the problem lies with giving a statement. Because anything you say can be construed, misconstrued, or used against you. So the less you say, the better, and the more you demonstrate fear and scared that you were going to die and that you were forced and you had no other choice and you just had to do this to save your life, the better you're going to be. So is there a perfect statement to give when you're in a shooting? <coughs> uh, I don't know. I think the thing about invoking your right to remain silent, okay, our, our, our Fifth Amendment right to remain silent and not incriminate ourselves. A lot of people look at only crooks do that. But every lawyer in the world does that. Well, that's not a good example because most lawyers are crooks. But lawyers will all tell you to invoke your right, no matter who it is. If you have a prosecutor or a DA get involved in something, he's being a lawyer, first thing he's going to do is go, hey, man, I need to consult with counsel. I don't want to make a statement until I consult with counsel. Why? Because it's smart. Because you're going to be in a better frame of mind. You're going to have somebody on the outside that's going to be looking out for your interests without the emotional connection of you, without the emotion of you just shooting somebody and using deadly force, you know, maybe once in your life, and, and now your whole life's flashing in front of you, and you've got to worry about civil suits and prosecution, and, you know, is a family going to sue, and, you know, is a guy going to live, and is he going to sue you? So there's all kind of problems with using deadly force. But the question was, hey, can you go over kind of, what you should say if you're in a deadly force situation so you don't get in trouble. Man, I mean, the, the best advice I could give is I, I don't want to make a statement until I talk to counsel. As soon as you say that, technically, by the law, cops can no longer ask you questions about what happened. They probably will, and you can answer. But as long as you get that out, nothing you say after that is going to be used against you because you've requested counsel. And per the laws, of, you know, the law is such a fluid thing, there's never no absolutes, and they can always come up with an excuse or reason why. And, you know, uh, we, used to, we used to question people all the time after they say they want a lawyer. Because we can't use that statement if they give us information to, to use against them. But if they take the stand and they say a different story, 
Now we can use that statement they gave us to impeach them. So there's an exception to the rule. So when people go, oh, if you ask for a lawyer, they can't use it against you, that's not true. There's an exception that we can get it in the back door if you take the stand. So guess what? If you give a statement, now you can't take the stand because we can ask you, the, the lawyer can ask you all the questions on that statement. If you give one answer that's different, now we can get that statement in and saying, were you lying then or are you lying now? So giving a statement hurts you. Uh, and, and there's all kind of things, how it can be maneuvered around legally to either help you or hurt you. But I guess the bottom line, if you talk to an attorney, if you can get an attorney on the phone, if you can say, hey, on advice of counsel, I was told not to say anything. I want to cooperate. I want to tell you what happened. But my attorney told me not to make a statement. Can you wait? You know, tr try not to be a dick to the cops. Don't, don't go to the cops. Hey, I know my rights. I'm right to right, remain silent. I ain't making a statement. Now, that's my rights. Because you're going to get arrested. Big deal. You're going to have to post bond or you're going to have to go through a hearing. I mean, you just may have to accept that fact that you're going to do that and go through that and not make a statement. Ideally, that's probably the best thing you could do. Because then an attorney is going to come and talk to you. You're going to get an attorney. An attorney is going to go over your statement. He's going to make sure when you've got a clear mind. If you say something, I mean, cops used to compare statements all the time. I mean, you know, people are like, oh, you know, cops need to be, you know, if, if four cops are on a scene, you know, if four suspects or witnesses are on a scene and the cops come up, first thing we do is separate the witnesses. Because we want to get what's called an independent statement from each witness. That way we can get a better picture on whether they're all telling the truth if all their statements are pretty much the same. Well, they don't do that with cops. <laughs> I mean, when we do a warrant or something, all the cops read each other's statements and it's like, hey man, you put in here that this happened. I don't remember that, blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, don't you remember? Oh yeah, that's right, it did happen. So now my statement's going to, I'm either going to add that or I'm going to correct my statement. Now people are going to go, oh, that's lying, that's illegal. Well, it's not, we're not doing it to conceal the truth. We're doing it so when we go to court, the defense attorney can't say, well, you said this happened and he said this happened. One of you's lying. Which one of you are lying? When neither one of you are lying, there was just a lot going on and you might have got the facts or you forgot something and you saw it. I mean, sometimes it'll be like, hey, you know what? I didn't see that. I'm not putting that in my statement. Okay. But if you, when you talk about it and you kind of say, and then something jogs your memory and you're like, oh, yeah, that's when uh, so-and-so tripped over the gun and we told him to watch his feet. Oh, yeah, now I remember. And then you refresh your recollection on that and you make your statement. And then when it goes to court, it'll look the same. When a DA reviews police reports and he sees something that's inconsistent, he will go back and go, hey, which one of you guys is right? Correct your statement, do an amendment, or what's going on here? And then the cops will go, hey, man, do you remember? I don't know, man. Yeah, I thought I was right. Well, I'll just take it out. Okay, take it out. Whatever. So, you know, people, it can be easy to, you know, and that can be used for the bad way, too. If you've got crooked cops and crooked DAs, DAs will sometimes, I will, I've been asked by DAs to take stuff out. Hey, man, can you take out that she was on the influence of cocaine? Because that makes, I like her statement and I want to use it. But if you say she's on the influence, it's not going to hold as much weight. So can you take that out? No, I ain't taking it out. Now, other cops would say, yeah, I'll take it out. I don't care. You know, if they don't ask and they don't know, you know, omission, omission of the truth is a lie. So I, I, I don't like that. Some cops are okay with it. Some DAs are okay with it. Some DAs will say, no, I don't want you taken out. We, we'll, we'll play the hand we're dealt and we'll move on. And I like those DAs because I'm that kind of cop, okay? We do what we need to do and we just tell the truth and we let them fall. And if a guy gets away, he gets away. Tough luck. Okay, but I'm not going to start compromising and guessing and tricking and getting caught up in lies and changing and hiding and doing all that crap just to get a conviction. Well, not everybody's like that. So when you, depending on the cop that arrives on scene, if you're in a small town to where they've never had anybody killed, they may not know what to do. So default might be, you know what, we got to arrest the guy, take his gun, get him downtown and let's book him and we'll deal with it from there. That may be their policy. So even if you give a statement cooperative, they may still arrest you. So is there a right statement? Like I said, uh, you don't want to say anything that gives the impression that you were not fearful of your life, that you weren't scared, that you're not worried about this, the guy got what he deserved, yeah, I'm tough and bad and all that. Even though you may feel that and think that, you don't want to give a statement like that because that's going to be used against you. Any statement you make that shows you were in fear of your life, that shows that you 
this was a high risk situation that the guy had a gun and it looked like a cannon and I remember when he pointed at me the barrel looked this big and I thought for sure I was dead I can't believe I got a shot off before he killed me I didn't know the gun wasn't loaded when I saw that knife the blade looked this big I don't care if it was this big he pulled that knife said he's gonna cut my throat I saw this big knife I I shot him and I, you know, I was in fear of my life. I thought he was going to stab me. If he had stabbed me, he could have got my gun. If he got my gun, he could have shot and killed me. Cops are always saying, hey man, I shot the guy because if he got my gun, he's going to kill me. So there's no reason a citizen can't say, hey, if he kills me or hurts me or knocks me down and knocks me out and he gets my gun, he could use that gun to kill me. So if you're trying to knock me out and, and take, make me incapacitated, then you're probably going to get shot because I don't want you getting my gun and shooting me. But uh, it's very difficult to, I don't think you call any lawyer and say, hey, what's the best statement to make? I have a feeling if you call a lawyer, they're going to say the best statement to make is no statement. Request counsel and keep your mouth shut. That doesn't always go over well. So, um, what, what's the best statement? I don't know. I, you know, if I made it more confusing than it was, then that's probably a good thing because it's not simple and there's no right answer. And, you know, it'd be nice if there was a right answer. And most lawyers, I think, are going to tell you the right answer. Request, request counsel and don't make a statement. Uh, unfortunately, cops look at that kind of, DAs look at that kind of uh, iffy. Cops look at it as iffy. If this guy was a good guy, why wouldn't he tell us? Why doesn't he give us a statement so we can help him? We don't want to, you know, if I was a cop there and I'd be like, dude, man, I don't want to arrest you. So if you tell me that you were in fear of your life, you know, maybe we can make this just for a homicide and I don't have to arrest you. And then the guy goes, oh, okay. But I wasn't really scared. Oh shit, now you just gave me a statement that I gotta take down and you just said you weren't really scared. And you know, and I've tried to talk legit citizens into, into don't, saying the right thing. You know, I've gone to houses before and saying, hey, you called us, once we come in, we have to take action. Do you really want us involved? And someone would say, yeah, yeah, I want you to come in because I'm tired of this shit. Then when we arrest the husband, wife, kid, or whatever, they're like, we didn't want you to arrest him. Uh, we just wanted you to talk to him. We didn't know you were going to arrest him. Well, too late. You got us involved. That's why I told you at the front door, are you sure you want us involved? Because if we're here, there's certain things that we're going to have to do. So when you talk to the cops and you say something, you may not know what you're saying, but there's certain things that they're going to have to do depending on what you said. So uh, I'm not sure if I answered that question or not. Uh, I'll put a link to why you should never talk to the cops in there. Uh, I also will put a link to, um, there's a website here in Texas. It's called Texas Law Shield that you can pay them once a year to have an attorney on retainer. Uh, and if you're involved in any shooting where you're lawfully authorized to have your gun, they'll give you free um, representation for the entire gun incident. So uh, I keep their card in my pocket. I have them on speed dial. And if I'm ever in a shooting, they're the, they're the person I call after I dial 911, I might call them before I dial 911. And they'll be using that. Why did you call your attorney before you dialed 911? You know what? Because <laughs> I've been in the legal system. I know how it works. And I know that this thing is just starting. It's not over. So um, it is what it is. Uh, I'll put a couple links and uh, hopefully that helped or give you an idea on, uh, on kind of what direction to head if you're involved in a shooting. Isn't that there?